It's now two years since we've had our Tesla Powerwall 2 installed. We can now take a look at all the data and understand the value that these types of system bring. Was it worth it or did we make a big mistake? Hi, John here. In this video, I will take you through how we have set up our Powerwall 2 and how that differs depending on the time of year. I will talk you through the cost to purchase and install, then round up with the performance and stats for two years of ownership with our Tesla Powerwall 2 here in the UK. Let me talk you through our setup and how we manage our Powerwall throughout the year, as this will give you some context to hang the performance and saving um, information onto. I have one Tesla Powerwall 2, which can store up to 13.5 kilowatt hours of energy when fully charged. We have a detached four bedroom house built in 2001. There's the two of us living here, me and my wife. We're both retired, which means we're at home for most of the days. We have two electric cars, a Tesla Model 3 and a Hyundai Kona. We also have a glass studio, which has three electric kilns. Our typical daily house usage is about 20 kilowatt hours per day. Here's a schematic of our system. You might want to pause that if you want to look at it in a bit more detail. Also there's a copy down below in the description uh, to my Dropbox. We have 6.2 kilowatts of solar PV array, which will charge the power battery when the panels are generating. If the solar panels are generating at their peak output, then the power wall can be charged from zero to 100% in just over two hours. That's fine in the summer months, but what happens in the winter when there's less sunshine? We'll cover that in a minute. We have a My Energy Zappy car charger, which can divert excess solar to charge the cars. We also have a My Energy Eddy, which heats our hot water from excess solar. The priority order for using this, this excess solar is house, Tesla Powerwall, Eddy, and then Zappy. How we configure the Powerwall differs depending on the time of year, and we swap between two modes self-powered and time-based control. So let's have a look at those, both those modes in a bit more detail. Self-powered mode stores any solar energy not used during the day to power the home at night. This stored energy will then be used when your home needs more power than solar can provide. When you have enough solar energy to offset all consumption, of your home and your power wall is fully charged, the excess energy will then be diverted to heat our water and charge our cars. Finally, after that, any excess over the top will be exported to the grid. Similarly, if you are consuming more than is available from your solar and power wall, you'll import energy from the grid. Self-power mode increases the amount of solar energy that powers your home and is the best way to reduce your carbon footprint and be more energy independent. In the summer months, we use the power wall in self-powered mode. And this mode targets the storage of excess solar energy during the day, which it then uses to power the house from sundown through to sunrise the following day. This means we can be 100% self-powered from solar and battery if there is sufficient solar activity during the day. Typically, we need a minimum of 20 kilowatt hours of solar generation each day to be 100% self-powered on a rolling daily basis. This is easy to achieve with our solar setup, provided the sun plays its part. Then there's the time-based control. Now, our electricity prices vary every 30 minutes during the day. Our energy supplier is Octopus Energy, and we're on their Agile tariff. The key difference with this Agile tariff is that it tracks the half-hour wholesale electricity rates. 
The rates are published daily for the following 24-hour period. This means that the cost of each unit of electricity changes every 30 minutes. <laughs> it's a bit like whack-a-mole for pricing and, and does actually make it a bit tricky to do price comparisons as a result. The Agile tariff has a peak time period between 4pm and 7pm every day. There's a variable off-peak time slot which is typically in the early hours of the morning from midnight through to around 7am. We've been on the Agile tariff since July and it has certainly saved us money on our electricity bill. Before that, we were on the Octopus Go tariff, which is a fixed unit rate. It still has an off-peak period, uh, in this case four hours overnight, and the rest of the time during the day is a, it is at a higher fixed unit rate. Time-based control, also referred to as load shifting, helps us to maximize savings by smartly charging and discharging. And there's actually two variants of the time-based control mode, which is balanced and cost-saving. In balance setting, its goal is to balance sustainability and cost savings, to reduce your peak usage while maintaining a high self-powered score. What this means in terms of behavior of your power wall, it will charge from excess solar during off-peak, the power wall will discharge during all periods, minimizing exports during off-peak. In cost-saving setting, the power wall's goal is to maximize savings, which means your self-powered score may be slightly lower. In terms of behavior, the power wall will charge from excess solar during off-peak, it will discharge during peak, and discharge in other periods to make room for solar based on energy forecast and historic usage patterns. In the winter months, we use the power wall in cost saving mode. This mode ensures that it can supply the house's needs during the peak time slot of 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. At other times, it'll favor the grid and then use the cheap off peak times in the early hours to charge up the battery. This means we are using cheaper stored electricity to run the house during the peak rates when, it, when, it, when electricity is more expensive. It was worth explaining those two different approaches to using the power wall as they have an impact on our overall cost savings and the power wall's performance. E.g. we save more money in the summer because we are self-powered for more of the time and we save less money in the winter when we will have to draw from the grid to supplement the lower levels of solar production here in the UK. Cost then, let's talk about costs. A cost to buy and install the Tesla Powerwall 1, sorry, Tesla Powerwall 2 with Gateway 1, was £6,808 back in December 2018. The amortized costs of the Powerwall is worked out by dividing its guaranteed lifetime in this case 10 years, into the total purchase cost. So £6,808 divided by 120 months, 10 years, equals £57 a month. Which means it's costing me £57 per month for the power wall over the 10 years. But how much am I saving each month by having the power wall? For the cost breakdown, there's a lot of factors to consider. I found it actually very difficult to work out exactly to the penny how much the power wall has saved. You know, why is this? Well, in short, there's been just too many variables. During the two years we've owned the power wall, we've swapped energy suppliers. We've had two totally different electric tariffs, which have been very different in their approaches a fixed unit rate tariff where we pay a fixed amount for a unit of electricity to a variable rate which tracks the wholesale electricity rates and the rates change every 30 minutes. We had additional solar panels fitted. So yeah, sort of lots of changes in pricing, in configuration, in suppliers. And it doesn't end there, unfortunately, because we also swap between self-powered mode and cost-saving mode which makes the power wall behave very differently. 
In self-powered mode, it tries its damnest not to import from the grid to actively import from the grid during the cheap rates in cost-saving mode. So completely different approach and uh, behavior. So I have actually found it difficult to split out how much electricity the power wall has taken from the grid versus how much it has taken from our solar panels. And as I said, we've also added a second PV solar array into the mix in year two. And this means that obviously the power wall is taking more excess solar as well. So unless I'm missing a trick here and anyone knows different, and if you do, please comment down below, uh, I found it almost impossible to boil all these changes and variables down to concrete figures. I will give you some cost saving figures and my rationale behind them in a bit. So keep watching um, and stay tuned for that. So let's just talk about what's happened in terms of how the power wall has performed over those two years and that will lead us into the costs. If I look at the Tesla mobile app and choose lifetime, this is what it shows me. These figures are from the 11th of December 2020, a couple of days past the two year anniversary, but they're close enough. For self-powered, our home has been self-powered for 56% of the time over the lifetime of the power wall. 30% of that came from our solar panels and 26% of that came from the power wall. The remaining 44% would have come from the grid. Scrolling down shows our solar offset against our house usage, again over the lifetime of the installation. So 55% of our energy uses has been supplied by solar. And you can see the totals in the bottom there. 11,644 kilowatt hours of solar generated against a house usage of 21,221 kilowatt hours. If I go into the energy usage option and choose lifetime, it shows me the following. Home usage, again the same, 21,221 kilowatt hours. Solar, 11,644 kilowatt hours generated. From the power wall, we've had 6,168 kilowatt hours. To the power wall, 6,897 kilowatt hours. And this figure incidentally isn't shown in the data that you're looking at. However, I record this daily from the Tesla app and just summarize it into a total. So that's where that figure has come from. From the grid, we've pulled 11,980 kilowatt hours and sent to the grid 1,544 kilowatt hours of sort of surplus solar generation that we couldn't use. The round trip efficiency for the power wall over these two years is 89%. Tesla's technical specs state a 90% round trip efficiency at 25 degrees Celsius for a 3.3 kilowatt charge stroke discharge of power at the beginning of the unit's life. So I'm actually really pleased with our performance as our power wall is installed outside, which means it needs to work harder to maintain the temperature inside on those cold mornings and allow it to take advantage of any early solar generation in the winter months. What has that 26% of electricity supplied from the power wall saved us in our electric bills over the past two years? As I mentioned earlier about all the changes and the variables over those two years, it's therefore a tricky question to give a definitive answer to. So what I've done, I've taken an average unit cost for our electricity over the two years to calculate this saving. The figure will be sort of there or thereabouts. I've not included any VAT or any standing charge in these particular figures as we would have been paying those anyway. So 26% of our overall home usage works out at, um, if we take our overall house usage of 21,221 kilowatt hours, 26% of that is 5,517 kilowatt hours. So 5,517 kilowatt hours times our average unit rate of 16 pence per unit comes out at 882 pounds 72 pence. 
£882.72 pence divided by two years, 48 months, comes out at £18.39 pence saving per month. If you recall, the Powerwall was costing us £57 a month over the 10 years, which means that the Powerwall is costing us £57 minus the £18.39 pence, brings it to £38.61 pence per month over the two years that we've had it so far. However, that's not entirely accurate as a picture going forwards in terms of forecasting, because as I said earlier, we've added additional solar panels 12 months into ownership of the Powerwall, which means that the savings going forward will actually be more as that additional solar panel um, reduces our grid import and will improve our overall self power percentage. However, you know, it gives you an idea of the costs and the savings. Have we had any issues or problems with the power wall? Well, just two actually. Three days after the power wall was commissioned, <laughs> it stopped working and was offline for three days. Tesla fixed the problem remotely and it's been working flawlessly ever since. I guess that initial problem was down to installation or configuration setup. The other issue we've had is not a fault of the power wall per se. I noticed a phantom draw on the grid once we had smart meters installed back in July 2019. After 18 months of investigation, this turned out to be an incompatibility issue between this particular brand and model of smart meter and the power wall. I've done a separate playlist of that particular problem and resolution if you want to learn more about that sort of up here. And uh, all in all, it's actually been faultless um, in terms of its operation, apart from those initial three day outage. Do I have any regrets? Well, just one really. We had the choice of uh, having a Gateway 2, which provides backup facility in the event of a power outage. Over the two years that we've had um, the power wall installed, we've had one power outage during the daytime, which lasted just a couple of hours. So the lack of power outages in our area was the main reason for not choosing the backup gateway two as an option. Plus it added another 1300 pounds on top of the price back in 2018. The backup facility does give you the ability to have a sort of a workaround to be able to manually charge the power wall by setting a backup percentage in the battery in case of a power outage. With the Gateway 1, we have no manual control. To, uh, we can't override when and by how much to charge the battery. It relies purely on its algorithm, which looks at historic usage patterns for solar generation, solar excess, house usage, and so on. In the winter, when we are in cost saving mode, it can sometimes get it wrong as it doesn't have any weather forecast built in. Now, I've already explained this in a lot more detail in another video, which again, I'll link up here if you're interested rather than going back through it, it again here. I guess it's a minor point and I'd say it's about 95% accurate. You know, it gets it right most of the time. It's just um, a little foible, I guess. So was it worth it? Uh, for me, yes. In short, yes, it was. Um, does it make financial sense? Over the long term, yes, I believe it does. The Powerwall will still be working past its 10 year warranty. Tesla guarantees that the battery will maintain at least 70% of its capacity to hold a charge during that 10 year period. Solar panels keep going for 25 years plus, which means all things being equal, we will still be saving past the 10 years that I've calculated to in this video. So it's certainly not a short term payback. However, over the longer term, I firmly believe it will pay for itself. And not only that, we've reduced our reliance on the grid by 26%. So please like, please subscribe, please comment, all those good things. Thank you for watching. If you've got any questions, then drop them down below and I will see you on the next video. All right, cheers for now. Bye.